Good morning and welcome to the FT Ireland member briefing on the EU mobility package. My colleague Dunnick Cody will provide a presentation detailed into changes that have been introduced to date, such as changes to cabotage rules, driver's errors, access to markets and return to base requirements. As an introduction from an EU perspective, the EU mobility package is a set of legislation that aims to create consistent and easily enforceable standards supporting driver safety, fair competition, sustainable business practices and other improvements to the transport industry throughout the EU. Mobility Package 1, as it, is known, as it is known, covers what is included in this briefing, access to markets, posting of workers, driver and rest times and operator licensing issues. And the EU Mobility Package 2, which is known as Clean Mobility, is the second mobility package that centres on the environmental impact of the transport industry throughout the EU, with a specific focus on passenger road transport, e.g. bus and coast mar coach market, initiatives will revolve around electrification, CO2 standards and specific regulations for market access. The package will create targets that are to be reached between 2025 and 2030 and we will provide more information in relation to this particular element of, of the mobility package in due course. Um, but now I would just uh, like to hand you over to uh, Dunica for his presentation. Thanks very much. Good morning everyone. Um, let me see. Ding, ding, ding. Just make sure we have the right screen on. Okay. I'm going to say a little bit, talk to you a little bit this morning about the mobility package. The mobility package, just one second, sorry, I hit the wrong. My apologies for that uh, interruption. I'm going to talk to you this morning about the mobility package. And as Aidan uh, explained, the mobility package, um, it's the latest challenge to come for those involved in the international transport business. In a sense, it's the successor to Brexit. Um, Brexit, the whole uh, Brexit situation has not been finally resolved yet. And hauliers have had the challenge of trying to uh, cope with changes that have come about uh, and are being implemented at different stages. Uh, the mobility package is clearer. Uh, it was adopted by the European Union in July 2020, and already three uh, parts of the mobility package are being implemented. And because the impact directly on transport uh, businesses, the transport business knows that this has already happened. Uh, the rules regarding the posting of drivers and the manual registration of uh, border crossings has been implemented since February this year. The rules involving driving times and rest times have been implemented since August last year. And uh, rules in respect of cabotage and access to the transport mar markets have been implemented since February 21st this year. When they use the phrase access to the transport market, it's distinctly different to that being, which is being used in respect of licensed haulage. Access to the transport market here refers specifically to access to a country's transport market rather than access to the transport industry. The European Commission's uh, mobility packages are a collection of three initiatives. Uh, mobility package one, which is the one that's currently in vogue, is about what they call euphemistically the social rules. The social rules are very much dealing with drivers' uh, driving time and rest times to ensure uh, safety. I mean, that's the primary uh, objective, but to ensure that drivers are not abused in respect of driving times and rest times. Added to that are the cabotage rules. Cabotage, internal transport, been carried out in the third country, uh, an Irish truck going to Germany and doing work within Germany on behalf of non-Irish customers or whatever, that's cabotage. So they've tightened up on the rules in respect of cabotage. They have brought in a phrase called posting of workers. 
This is done on the IMI, which is uh, the Internal Market Information System. And already that is in place, and I'll talk a little bit about it. They are also addressing the issue of what are called letterbox companies, companies that uh, give the impression of being set up in country A, but are actually established in country B, even though they're operating in country A. And to counteract that practice, they have brought in return to base rules, uh, the main provisions of which are that the vehicle has to return to base at least once every eight weeks, and the driver has to return to base at least once every four weeks. That's the package you're dealing with this morning. Mobility package two is going to deal, as Aidan already mentioned, with what's called clean mobility, promoting combined transport, trying to find the most, um, the lowest emission means of transporting passengers and goods between different points. Uh, they are going to, in this stage, Mobility Package 2, set CO2 emission standards for cars and vans. In stage three, they'll be looking at emission standards for uh, trucks and buses. They are also adamant that they're going to use public procurement purchasing power in order to promote the change from fossil fuel intention in fossil fueled internal combustion engine powered vehicles to alternatively powered vehicles. And there's a recognition by the European Union that the purchasing power that the public procurement sector has far outweighs that of the private sector. So they're able to drive the initiative for the change to cleaner mobility through public procurement. And finally, they're going to allow bus and coach market access rules to be reviewed. So to promote the notion of combined transport, they are uh, going to uh, deregularize, for want of a better phrase, access to ferries, to airports, to railway stations, to bus operators, so that the passenger will have a more linked up alternative to using their private car. The third mobility package is going to deal with safe mobility. And it's going to look at, we already are aware of the safety features involved in vehicles. So within cars, we have airbags, seat belts, et cetera. Within trucks, we have the um, lane departure warning, automatic cruise control. The enhancement of all those features combined with trying to bring in a safety standards in respect of infrastructure. Uh, so where we already have, for example, a standard European driving license, where they are going to try and bring in standards for road markings, barriers, zebra crossings, traffic lights, all that kind of thing. Um, that's coming under the safe mobility. The second part of the safe mobility is going to be dealing with digital information exchange and electronic communication. On the European mainland, the primary document that is used by transport companies when uh, carrying out uh, services uh, is a CMR. It's a convention on the contract for the international carriage of goods by road that is agreed internationally. And it is a standard set of terms and conditions. In Ireland, we have the FTA terms and conditions, FTA Ireland ones, or IRHA or whatever. Uh, companies have their own uh, terms and conditions as well. And one of the things that happens currently is, for example, you'll have a driver delivering goods from A to B. He will have the consigner's delivery note. He'll have the transport company's delivery note. He may well have a manifest. So you have three documents, all of which have to be signed and acknowledged, etc. The CMR, which is the European one I referred to earlier on, that overcomes that difficulty by linking the consignor the consignee and the carrier. And there are specific liabilities and rights associated with each party to the movement of the goods. And of course, there is also an identical creator of the document on a CMR. And the hope is that the European Union are looking at this information exchange being done digitally, so we don't have forests of paperwork being created to support uh, in international transport. And finally, on clean mobility, 
we already mentioned in the mobility package two, they're going to have CO2 standards for cars and vans. In mobility package three, they're going to have CO2 standards for trucks, buses, and they'll be looking at things like the use of aerodynamics, tire labeling, and realistic alternative fuel comparisons, price comparisons. So you, you may well have uh, liters of fuel at a certain price and certain amounts of gas at a, a different price, and you're able to make comparisons between the two. That's what their ambition is. Back to the one that's of immediate concern to all transport, international transport operators, mobility package one. One of the things that they have done here is they have amended the traditional EU 561 regulation and the 1065 regulation in respect of tachographs and driver's hours and rest periods. A regular rest, weekly rest, which is a 45 hours minimum, must now be taken by a driver outside the truck cabin. Even if more than eight hours were spent on a ferry where the driver has access to a bunker couchette, the requirement is that the 45 hour break must be taken away from the vehicle. From an Irish perspective, the benefit of the ability now to take consecutive reduced weekly rests on international trips, which means a driver can leave Ireland, take 45, 24, 24, and 45 hour uh, weekly rest periods leads to efficiency. However, those reduced weekly rest periods have to be compensated for when the driver comes back to base. And under the existing uh, EU 561 rules and regulations, a driver has to average 45 hours weekly rest anyway, because any time you take a reduced weekly rest, which is at least 24 hours, the compensatory amount has to be repaid back to bring your average up to 45 hours. Unlike a regular 45 hour weekly rest, a reduced weekly rest can be taken in the cab. So you can see the incentive for taking two reduced weekly rests in your trip, bearing in mind that as I already said, the driver has to be provided with the means of getting back to base every four weeks anyway. A reduced weekly rest up to now has to be uninterrupted. But in this new mobility package, it can be interrupted to get on and off a ferry, providing the ferry crossing is eight hours long. That is a change to the existing regulation. Sometimes people hear phrases and terms and don't listen to the entire context. And one of the things I've come across in our training, uh, there's, people have heard about an extension of driving time. This is an amendment to EU 561 and subject to the extension, not jeopardizing road safety, uh, daily or weekly uh, driving or working time can be extended by a maximum of one hour, providing the driver is going to reach their base or place of residence to commence a reduced weekly rest. The emphasis on base or place of residence, not the destination when they're doing a trip to the continent, but it's the vehicle base or place of residence of the driver. They can extend their daily or weekly driving time by a maximum of one hour. And of course, do have to compensate for that extra hour within three weeks. They can extend it by two hours, preceded by a 30 minute break, if they are going to take a regular or longer weekly rest, not the 24 hour. And again, the same rules and conditions apply. It must be, uh, if they're going back to their base or place of residence. And where they avail of this extension of driving time, a printout has to be done at base and they have to note on the back of the printout the reason why their working or driving time has been extended by that period. So it is strictly associated with weekly rest and base, nowhere else. Cabotage, 
since the 21st of February this year, the rules have already been amended. The headline rule is the four day cooling off period. So you can do three cabotage trips within seven days of arriving into the country. But after that, you have to take a four day cooling off period. To facilitate cabotage, drivers have to be posted on the internal market information system. The internal market information system is a secure multilingual, multilingual online tool that facilitates the exchange of information between public authorities involved in the practical implementation of EU law. So for example, if I were an Irish qualified dentist and I applied to work in a practice in Portugal and I don't speak Portuguese, and the Portuguese practice is not familiar with English, the application and the associated uh, confirmation that I am a qualified dentist can be done through the IMI, the Internal uh, Market Information System, because I can put in my details in English and within the system it's translated into Portuguese and the Portuguese people can read it in their own language. So it's a facilitation of the exchange of information in respect of qualifications, et cetera, within the European Union. And it is now being adopted for the posting of drivers. And FTA Ireland have a very helpful video on how to use the posting and IMI system uh, on their website. The idea behind posting is that the driver who is driving the vehicle that's performing the cabotage is earning at least the minimum wage of the country where the cabotage is being carried out. It is crucial that the haulier retains evidence of the cabotage. The IMI can also be used in order to verify the facts of the cabotage. And when a driver is posted on the IMI, the driver must be provided with either a hard copy or an electronic copy of the posting so that if he is stopped at a checkpoint or whatever uh, interaction with the authorities, he has proof of his uh, posting with them. However, if the authorities wish to, they can request the operator to support what's declared on the IMI and to do that, the operator must be able to submit documentation such as employment contracts, working records, salary confirmation, tachograph records, consignment notes, and copies of the declaration for the posting. And one of the uh, lessons that comes out of this posting is that effectively, if you are posting a driver, you shouldn't be doing a kind of an all embracing annual or six monthly posting. You should be doing it specifically for each posting requirement so that if you are requested for information, you're not having to provide 12 months tachographs records, 12 months salary, uh, 12 months consignment notes, etc. Keep the posting as specific as possible when you are doing a posting for a driver. The posting of drivers applies, as I've already said, to cabotage operations but it also applies to non-bilateral international transport operations. So if an Irish hauler sends a vehicle from here to Germany and decides, I haven't got a load back to Ireland, I'll do a load from Germany to Spain, he then has to post the driver in Germany and in Spain. The truck will be going through France en route from Germany to Spain, but transit is exempt from posting. So the internal movement within the European Union from Germany to Spain by an Irish registered truck requires posting in the country where the collection started in Germany and in the destination country, Spain. It does not apply to uh, internal bilateral uh, transport, international, sorry, bilateral transport operations, cross-trade operations involved with involving limited loading and or unloading activities. So I might dispatch a vehicle from Ireland to do deliveries in France and Italy, and maybe he's doing collections in Italy and France on the way back to Ireland. But in that case, those cross-trade operations do not require posting. 
transit operations I've already mentioned, and the first or final leg of a combined uh, transport operation. You do not require posting. Since the, 20, the 2nd of February this year, a border crossing has to be recorded by a driver on their tachograph, and they must make the entry to the tachograph at the first possible planned stop. Uh, this is, there's a little bit of dispute on this in Holland because of the location of Holland and the volume of traffic in and out. It's not always possible to pull into the first truck stop and record your stop. So that's why they're allowing for possible or planned stop. The tachograph um, upgrading to do this uh, is subject also to tachograph, to a uh, timetable. Uh, we have moved from the analog tachograph, which was uh, acceptable up to May 2006, to the smart tachograph, which has been in force since uh, the 19th of June, 2019. And we're going to have a new uh, smart two tachograph in force from the 21st of August, uh, 2023. In order to record the border crossing, these smart two tachographs will facilitate that. And smart two tachographs will have to be retrofitted to all vehicles and international journeys that are fitted with analog or old digital tachographs uh, by the 31st of December, 2024. And they'll have to be retrofitted, these new smart two tachographs, to all vehicles that have had smart tachographs fitted in them by the 21st of August, 2025. All light commercial vehicles doing over two and a half thousand um, maximum authorized mass will have to have these smart two tachographs fitted from the 1st of July, 2026. In the case of letterbox operations identified, and this to do with cabotage effectively, to address the issue, vehicles must return to base at maximum intervals of at most eight weeks. I mentioned that already. Transport companies have to prove their main activity in the establishment country by having an effective and stable establishment in the member state, having appropriate financial standing, and having the required professional competence. Light commercial vehicles, which Aidan alluded to earlier on, the change in respect of uh, licensing of those will be applicable only to those engaged in international trips. For that, they will require international authorizations and they can be got, as Catherine will tell you later on from the uh, Department of Transport. Uh, it will be enforced though from the 21st of May this year. And you'll have much similar rules as you have to HGVs in respect of financial standing for a HGV. It's 9,000 for the first vehicle, 5,000 for every sub subsequent vehicle. For a light commercial vehicle, 1,800 and 900 for every subsequent vehicle. They'll also require to have tachographs fitted from 2026. And finally, in respect of the mobility package, one of the requirements that has been uh, highlighted is that from the 31st of December, 2024, all drivers must carry proof of working, driving, on-call and rest times for the current day and the preceding 56 days for all journeys subject to compulsory recording. So that's all in scope work. That's a summary of the mobility package. And be aware, the mobility package is part of a series of packages rather than an end in itself. Okay, Aidan, thank you very much. Brilliant, Dunica. Thanks very much for that um, super informative uh, presentation and, and the detail in it has been uh, made very clear. And obviously we're here to kind of assist members um, uh, with, with information. And as Dunica mentioned, we do have a number of briefing notes covering uh, border crossings, the posting of workers and, and a general one in relation to the mobility package. Uh, but I think it's very interesting, obviously, with, with the, the length and breadth of, of this particular work from an EU Commission's perspective that uh, there's certainly a lot to consider uh, into the future. I, I think that we're particularly interested in the clean mobility elements which are, which are coming up. Um, and as you may know, we have an alternative fuels working group and, and everybody's more than welcome to attend these monthly meetings, but uh, certainly uh, preparing for a future will certainly I think make your business uh, more competitive, particularly when, when you're looking at the changes that are going to be required from a public procurement uh, perspective. Um, and uh, our truck safe audit at Green Standard as well. I think there's more incentive to engage in, in relation to that 
uh, initiative and uh, we'll continue to develop uh, the recognition for that particular program. I just have one question for um, Dunica uh, that yes. came in, uh, was in relation to what's the difference between the, the smart tachograph and the current tachograph, well, well the older uh, pre-smart tachograph? Well, the current tachograph is digital and all it is doing is recording the analog data in a digital format. The smart tachograph has a satellite positioning uh, facility in it. So the vehicle's uh, journey can be tracked on a three hourly basis by satellite using Galileo. I only found that out this morning, the European uh, satellite that's in space. So your tachograph will have a positioning um, capability as well as recording of driver's hours and working time. 